Good afternoon. My name is Don Elder. I'm a professor of history at Eastern New Mexico University. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the state of New Mexico that I bet you did not know. We're gonna start out on a day in 1945, August 6th to be precise, on an island called Tinian, which is part of the Marianas Island chain. A B-29 super fortress, a four engine bomber that was part of the United States Army Air Force. Back in those days, there was no independent Air Force. The Air Force is part of the Army. Army Air Force B-29 took off and it had literally the best crew that could be found in the U.S. Army Air Force. The pilot, Paul Divitz, the best bomber pilot in the U.S. Army Air Force. Co-pilot, best. Bombardier, best. Navigator, best. Radio operator, best. Flight engineer, the best. The gunners, the very best. And these guys had been training together for months. They had literally gone directly to Omaha, Nebraska to a Boeing factory located there to pick up their B-29 and taken it to Westover Field, which is located on the border between Utah and Nevada. They had trained, had flown to the Marianas Tinian. But when they took off on that fateful day in August of 1945, they had one person aboard the plane that wasn't a part of the crew wasn't part of the team, hadn't gone to Omaha, hadn't gone to Westover, hadn't flown to the Marianas. As a matter of fact, he wasn't even in the U.S. Army Air Force. He was a Navy guy. He was the Navy captain, which is the equivalent of a colonel in the U.S. Army. So what is a guy from the U.S. Navy doing aboard a B-29 on that particular day in 1945? Well, he's there because he was singularly suited to do one particular task, a task that he had started a journey towards in 1909 in a place called Fort Sumner, New Mexico. The man we're talking about is William Parsons, better known in history as Deke Parsons. Parsons was born in 1901 and was actually born in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, there was a reason why he was born in Illinois, because his great-grandfather had been the governor of the state of Illinois. On his maternal side, his maternal side included a U.S. senator from Wisconsin. So the Parsons family was very well connected, but they decided for reasons of health to relocate, to go to a dry climate. And so in 1909, they had relocated to or Southern Mexico. That's where William Parsons went to school. Uh, he went to school in Fort Sumner, uh, was homeschooled for a year by his mother because he was a precocious lad, was a really smart guy. And here's my proof. The mom actually had a job teaching in Santa Rosa, New Mexico. She was a teacher at Santa Rosa High School in Santa Rosa, New Mexico. And her son went there for his freshman year in high school. When he left Santa Rosa High School, he was a junior, had just completed the requirements for the junior year in high school. He had completed that in one year. In one year, he had completed three years of high school work. So he then transferred back to Fort Sumner for what was his senior year of high school even though he was only 16 years old at the time. He finished up at Fort Summer High in the class of 1917, and he wanted to gain admission to the United States Naval Academy. I'm not sure how familiar you are with the way things work at military academies, but you cannot just apply for admission to a U.S. military academy. You have to be appointed by either a member of the U.S. House of Representatives or you have to be appointed by a U.S. Senator. Now, there is no way five years earlier that William Parsons could have applied for admission to a military academy by appointment from a U.S. Senator because if you know anything about the state of New Mexico, New Mexico didn't become a state until 1912 and therefore didn't have any senators. So the custom of appointing people in New Mexico was a very new one. 
and Parsons was going to be one of the first people from New Mexico to gain admission to a military academy through an appointment by Congress. So what he did was he wrote to one of the two senators in the United States Senate from New Mexico at the time, a gentleman by the name of Jones, and he asked for an appointment. And Jones says, well, I've got other people that I'd rather appoint, but I tell you what we're going to do. You have to pass a test to be able to qualify, not just anybody. Like when I was 18 years old, a senator or congressman couldn't have just appointed me to West Point. I would have had to pass an entrance test first and then gain my appointment. So Senator Jones says, I'm going to give a test in Roswell, New Mexico. You get to Roswell, New Mexico on a particular date, you take the test and, well, if you pass, then I'll consider, but I want to let you know up front, there were other candidates from the state of New Mexico I'm leaning towards right now. So at the age of 16, William Parsons went down to Roswell, New Mexico, took the test, and was the only person there that passed the test that day. So by default, Joan said, well, okay, but now here's the problem, you're only 16 years old. And Parsons must have been a very, very persuasive individual because he somehow convinced Senator Jones that even though he was gonna be way younger than anybody else at the academy, he should gain an appointment. He persuaded Jones and Jones appointed William Parsons to the U.S. Naval Academy. When he got there, that was a time when virtually everybody in the military got a nickname. Everybody who went to West Point, everybody who went to Annapolis was given a moniker to go along in place of a regular name. Like the top ranking general in the U.S. Army Air Force in the Second World War was Henry Arnold. Nobody ever called him that, they called him Hal Arnold. The most famous admiral in the Pacific was a guy by the name of William Halsey. Nobody ever called him William Halsey, they called him Mole Halsey. So William Parsons was going to get a nickname. Because he was young, because he was slender, and because he was so studious, the cadets at Annapolis looked at his last name, which was Parsons, and decided to give him the nickname Deacon, which was then shortened down to Deke. So if you've ever wondered how Deke Parsons got his nickname, it was from his fellow midshipman at Annapolis. So what happens is that William Parsons get a, a commission, he graduates from Annapolis, his commission an ensign in the U.S. Navy, and is assigned to command a gun turret on the battleship Idaho. So his very first assignment is with ordnance, with weaponry. And he becomes well known as a person who definitely had an aptitude for things having to do with heavy artillery. To the point that after a couple of years on the USS Idaho, he was sent to the Navy School for Ballistics which is where they train people to become even better with artillery. He then goes back and becomes an officer on another ship and proves so good that the Navy decides, okay, what we're gonna do is we're going to assign you to the U.S. Navy Bureau of Ordnance, which is in charge of all type of weaponry for the Navy. And at that point, the Department of Ordnance in the U.S. Navy was connected to something called the Naval Research Laboratory, the NRL. That was gonna be an important connection because at that particular time, during the 1930s, the Naval Research Laboratory was made aware of a development that had taken place in Great Britain. In Great Britain, they had invented something called radar. Radar was a brand new phenomenon, and a lot of people in the U.S. Navy thought that there was no practical application for radar. D. Parsons was the exception to the rule. He said, no, on the other hand, I think this could be really valuable for the Navy. And so he became really involved in radar research, and lo and behold, it's a good thing for the United States that he did, because radar was gonna to prove to be of immense value to the U.S. Navy in the Second World War. 
So as the Second World War approaches and it starts, the fact that this guy knows something about radar makes him very highly sought after in the U.S. Navy. And I think just simply for radar itself, would, that would have been important. But Parsons also saw something else that radar could be useful for. In conjunction, and I don't want to make it seem like Parsons was the guy who just developed this on his own, in conjunction with a few other people, he came up with the idea of putting small radar mechanisms in the shells of artillery rounds so that as an artillery projectile went into the air, it would send out radar signals. And if it came close enough to an enemy plane to get bounced back, the shell would explode. It's called a proximity fuse. And it was one of the things that proved to be decisive, especially in the Pacific, shooting at Japanese planes that were trying to crash into American planes. You didn't actually have to hit the Japanese plane to be successful. You just had to be close to it. So here again, Dee Parsons was going to become a famous individual, if for nothing else than that alone. But what happened was, after he helped develop the proximity fuse, he got a new assignment. He got a message that he should report to the United States and should go to Lamy, New Mexico. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Lamy, New Mexico, but it doesn't really seem like a place that a U.S. Navy captain should be sent because it's out in the middle of nowhere. It's just a whistle stop on the Atchison-Topeka and Santa Fe Railroad. Uh, when he got there, he was then put into a car and was taken to a place that uh, a year and a half before didn't exist, a place called Los Alamos, New Mexico. And he found out that the United States was developing a secret weapon, a weapon that would use atomic energy to create a force field that would lead to the most powerful explosion that had ever been seen on the face of the earth. And not only is he assigned to that project, but he quickly becomes the associate director of what was known as the Manhattan Project. He worked hand in hand with J. Robert Oppenheimer, the guy that is regarded as being the father of the atomic bomb. Parsons initially is put to work developing a technology that is known as implosion. The idea that you can take a metallic ball coat the inside of it with a radioactive substance, in this case plutonium, and then you could implode the ball together, creating critical mass leading to an explosion. For reasons which are a little bit murky to this day, Parsons was taken off that project and was put onto the project to use uranium, uh, the isotope 238, uh, and if you ever wondered why the minor league ball, to ball club in New Mexico is known as the isotopes. It's because of the state of New Mexico's connection with working with the isotope of uranium. Uh, so without doing a science presentation, which my colleagues here at Eastern New Mexico University would be much better able to do, what the concept was, was to take uranium, a small amount, take a small amount of uranium, put them at opposite sides of the tube, and then create a simultaneous explosion at each end of the tube that would hurdle those balls of uranium together. When they met in the middle, that would create a critical mass leading to explosion. And you're thinking, aha, Dick Parsons got his start in ballistics. He got his start in learning what type of gunpowder charge was necessary to get a certain velocity. So that's a critical component. If you don't have that right, you're not going to achieve critical mass. The bomb's not gonna work. So Dee Parsons isn't really doing anything with nuclear physics. He's doing ordnance. He's doing what he just started out his Navy career doing, which was figuring out how much gunpowder to put in the tubes to get the uranium at the critical mass at the right moment. So, he does his homework, 
does it well, and uh, he did his homework so well that Oppenheimer said, we don't even need to test this. I know for a fact that looking at his mathematical equations, this is gonna work. He's gonna get those two charges of uranium going fast enough, they'll hit, they'll create a critical mass, it's gonna work. Ironically, the one that he had started on, the implosion idea, was the one that was still so theoretical in the summer of 1945 that we had to test that to see if that would actually work. And if you've ever heard of the Trinity site, uh, a distance from Alamogordo, New Mexico, that's what was actually tested there. And sure enough, it works. So now we developed one bomb that used uranium, a gun process as it was known, to shoot uranium charges together to create an explosion. And we created one bomb using plutonium that would use implosion. The first one that was perfected, as I said, was the uranium. So a weapon was constructed and was transported on board the USS Indianapolis. It was a cruiser in the US Navy out to Tinian and then was going to be put on board a US Army bomber. Ironically, a couple of days after dropping off the atomic bomb at Tinian, the USS Indianapolis was torpedoed and sunk by a Japanese submarine. And it's ironic to think what would have happened if the Japanese sub had sunk the Indianapolis before it got to Tinian rather than afterwards. But at any rate, the bomb got there and uh, the idea was, okay, you arm the bomb and then you put it on the plane and the plane takes off. There was only one problem. The B-29 was a remarkable airplane. But it wasn't perfect. Uh, B-29s routinely crashed trying to take off because Tinian is a long way away from Japan and it's going to be uh, the B-29 that's going to take the atomic bomb is going to be carrying maximum fuel and it's going to be carrying just one bomb as opposed to a whole load of bombs. But that one bomb is going to be heavier than a load of bombs would be for a B-29. So there's no guarantee that the B-29 that day of August of 1945 is gonna successfully take off. What happens if it crashes trying to take off and the bomb is fused? Well, then Tinian is going to be vaporized and everybody on that island is gonna die. So what they decided to do was they decided to actually arm the bomb, activate the fuse once it had taken off. And what better person to put in the B-29 that particular day to arm the bomb after it had taken off than the guy who developed the mechanism by which the bomb would work in the first place. So that's how you find a kid from Fort Sumner, New Mexico, on board the Enola Gay, which was the nickname given to the B-29, piloted by Paul Tibbetts that day. And what Deke Parsons had to do was after the plane had reached cruise altitude, he had to go down into the bomb bay of the B-29, which is a very cramped, very dark little receptacle and he has to arm the nuclear bomb and he does he successfully arms it gets the fuse going and tells Colonel Tibbetts you're good to go so the B-29 gets to Japan flies to the city of Hiroshima now where the Japanese suspicious no, the Japanese were not suspicious because B-29s had been flying over Japan since the summer of 1944. And for the previous three weeks, lone B-29s painted with the same insignia as the Enola Gay had been flying 
keep going. Keep over, going. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> I'll set dramatically for the 29th yeah, flying over, over Hiroshima. Uh, so for three weeks, B-29s had been flying over Hiroshima at exactly the same time in the morning. And so the Japanese had grown complacent. They were used to B-29s just seemingly flying harmlessly over Hiroshima. Only that particular B-29 dropped a bomb. Uh, it's the beginning of the atomic age. Uh, it is the first bomb that is dropped in combat. And of course, three days later, a plutonium bomb was going to be dropped on Nagasaki. Now, you might think that that's the end of the story when it comes to Deke Parsons and the end of the story when it comes to J. Robert Oppenheimer. No, actually what happens is that Deke Parsons stays in the Navy and stays a part of their crack research team while J. Robert Oppenheimer stays a part of the American Atomic Bomb Program. But there's going to be a change. During the course of working on the atomic bomb, which uses the principle of nuclear fission, there were some physicists that came up with the idea that there was actually an even more powerful bomb that could be developed, not using fission, but using nuclear fusion, where atoms fuse together and release energy. And I don't know how familiar you are with the principle of fusion as opposed to fission, but fusion is 40 times more powerful than fission is. So these individuals recognize that if you could develop an atomic bomb using fusion technology, you'd have a super weapon. And they advocated that the United States should begin work on developing that type of a bomb. J. Robert Oppenheimer disagreed. He was of the opinion that the world had a lethal weapon and it didn't need a super lethal weapon. And so on philosophical grounds, J. Robert Oppenheimer said, this is not something that the United States should pursue. That did not go over well with a number of leading physicists. A number of leading physicists thought that J. Robert Oppenheimer was wrong. And they wondered why he was opposing it. Oppenheimer, to his dying day, said it was just literally overkill, that there was no need for a fusion weapon. And he thought that the world was unsafe enough with nuclear bombs using fission. And he said, there's no reason to develop a fusion weapon. Other physicists said, well, the Soviet Union, four years after the United States developed its atomic bomb, developed an atomic bomb of their own, and they said, are the Russians going to be working on a fusion weapon? And Oppenheimer said, what if they do? If they develop one, we're smart enough, we can develop one in a hurry. But let's not be the first people to develop that weapon. But physicists, not all of the physicists, but some really powerful ones, still felt that Oppenheimer's explanation wasn't good enough. They said there has to be something else going on here. And they began to accuse J. Robert Oppenheimer, the guy who had piloted the atomic bomb program, of being a communist. They said that's why he's opposed to developing a fusion weapon, because he's sympathetic to the Soviet Union. And as proof, they pointed out that uh, during the 1930s, J. Robert Oppenheimer, if not a member of the Communist Party, had been sympathetic to Communist Party platforms and had a brother who had been a member of the Communist Party, and his wife had been a member of the Communist Party. So they said that's why Oppenheimer is opposed to developing a fusion weapon, because he's a Soviet agent. So what they did 
was they started a procedure to strip Oppenheimer of his security clearance. Say that because he was disloyal, he shouldn't be allowed to work on atomic programs and that would clear the way for the development of the fusion weapon. And so, in what became known as in the matter of the United States versus J. Robert Oppenheimer, the U.S. government began a security hearing about the loyalty of J. Robert Oppenheimer. Some people came forward to defend it, necessary, or uh, most notably Leslie Groves, who was the top-ranking general who oversaw the atomic bomb program. He was the guy that had actually hired Oppenheimer for the job. And Groves swore categorically that J. Robert Oppenheimer was not a communist. He was a loyal American. That he might have, during the 1930s, listened to what communists had to say, but by the 1940s, and clearly by the 1950s, was a 100% loyal American and had no sympathy for the Soviet Union whatsoever. And uh, he said, Oppenheimer is too smart for that. Oppenheimer is the smartest guy I've ever worked with. Oppenheimer knew everything about everything. And then he paused and said, I take that back. There was one thing Oppenheimer didn't know about. Oppenheimer knew nothing about baseball. Well, maybe that qualifies you as being disloyal. I Groves didn't think so. It's just kind of rare that you found an American in those days who didn't know anything about baseball. But uh, even though many people came forward to testify on behalf of J. Robert Oppenheimer, the U.S. government did indeed yank Oppenheimer's security clearance in 1954, and Oppenheimer would have nothing to do with the atomic program from that point on that he had literally created. News of that got across the street, literally, in Washington, D.C. to be Parsons. Parsons had remained great friends with J. Robert Oppenheimer. They had maintained their close relations that had been established right here in New Mexico at Los Alamos. And I'm not making this up. The day that B. Parsons found out that his good friend J. Robert Oppenheimer had been denied clearance for disloyalty, Parsons became visibly, visibly agitated. So much so to the point that that night he began to suffer chest pains, was taken to a hospital, and literally when he was in the examining room, died of a heart attack. So the two friends that had bonded together in New Mexico at Los Alamos remained friends literally until B. Parsons' dying day, and B. Parsons' dying day had everything to do with what happened to his good friend J. Robert Oppenheimer. So that's the story of B. Parsons. A young man that grew to maturity in Fort Sumner, New Mexico, spent a year in Santa Rosa, New Mexico, left New Mexico thinking that that was probably the last time he might see New Mexico, little knowing that he would come back to New Mexico and help develop a weapon that ended the Second World War, but started what became known as the nuclear raids that we're still living in today. So I hope you enjoyed listening and uh, learning a little bit about uh, Dee Parsons. Uh, I love telling stories about the state of New Mexico. I love telling stories about the United States in general. And uh, if you're interested in uh, learning more about history, I could certainly recommend a great university. That would be Eastern New Mexico University. I'd like to thank my good friend John Hauser for giving me the opportunity to do this presentation. There are a lot of us that have done presentations for John, and obviously uh, I would hope that uh, some people might say, well, Eastern sounds like a good place to hang out and learn some things about New Mexico and the United States. So I would certainly encourage you, if you have any interest in
furthering your college education to check out Eastern New Mexico University. So thank you for the opportunity. Have a good day.